Okay, so good morning again. Uh, this is a second lecture of Introduction to Mobile Robotics course. Uh, and today's lecture is going to be dedicated to localization. Uh, as usually, you can scan QR code to open the presentation on your device, or you can use short link below. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to scan if you will. Today's lecture is on localization. So we will first define localization problem. Then we will see how uh, localization can be defined in probabilistic form uh, using recursive bias and estimation. Then we will talk on two solutions for recursive bias and estimation framework, Kalman filter and particle filter. So in last lecture, we have seen this uh, scheme of uh, mobile robot control. And uh, we discussed sensors which are used in modern robots nowadays. And today we're moving to the second part of the scheme is to localization. So basically using sensors readings, uh, we will try to localize our robot in space. So our goal is to define where we are in some space as a robot. So localization, at least in robotics, uh, stands for the process of tracking of robot pose, which is position and orientation in space. Uh, and by space, we mean some fixed reference frame. So for example, it can be a reference frame fixed to the map. We have a predefined environment map and just we want to know where we are on this map. And localization, um, can be different uh, in terms of state space. For example, we can have 2D localization, X, Y, and some uh, heading angle theta. Uh, and usually in wheeled robots, we use exactly this form because uh, wheeled robots are moving on the flat uh, surface um, on the floor. And that's why uh, we are not really interested uh, to know uh, Z coordinate because we, we just consider it's constant. It is not always the case, but usually it is. Uh, also, there is 3D localization, for example, in quadcopters or different flying robots. Uh, we want to know also Z coordinate and all three rotation orientation angles of our robot. So also, there are all different approaches to localization based on where our robot is moving inside the buildings, and it is called indoor localization or outside the building, uh, and it is called outdoor localization. Um, so. This is a simple definition of localization problem. We just want to know our position and orientation in space. That's what we are trying to solve. And why localization even matters? Uh, because knowing the precise position in space, uh, it's a first step to any motion planning and execution. If we know where we are, we cannot plan anything. We cannot move because we just have to know where we are starting. And this is a real example from uh, real world. This is a patrolling robot which was patrolling the area around some mall uh, and eventually fall down into the pool because its localization uh, get lost. So basically robot didn't know where it is uh, and it is ended up in the pool. So that's why localization matters. And that's why this is basically the first topic we are discussing. So formal uh, problem definition is on the slide. We are giving some uh, vector of our, our previous poses from first moment of time to t minus one. Uh, also, we have u, which is history of control signals. And by control signals here, we mean some signals or commands we are giving robot. For example, move one meter front, turn 30 degrees left, and so on. So we're somehow controlling our robot. Uh, even though robot is, can be autonomous, uh, still, there is some commands sent, which are sent to wheels and a steering wheel uh, to move and turn robot. And U vector is exactly these control signals. And also, we are giving uh, sensor measurements. Again, from first moment of time, we started to operate and to the current moment of time. And we usually have map. We will discuss further that a map is not always necessary. And there are approaches which are called simultaneous localization and mapping where we map the environment at the same time we are localizing but uh, we are not discussing uh, in details of these approaches in this course uh, and in terms like uh, in this course we will consider that we are given some map of the environment and by map uh, we can 
mean any um, any basically anything uh, describing how our environment looks like. It can be real map which human uh, used to see or some other like mathematical description of the environment, some vectors, anything. And given all that, uh, we have to find our current pose in the space. So we know where we were uh, in previous moments of time. We know uh, all the control signals. We know our measurements of all our sensors. We have a map and we just have to find where we are in space. Uh, so this is a classical uh, problem formulation for localization, most general one. Uh, so we, before moving further, we have to discuss some mathematical notions. And first one is Markov process. Uh, I guess you're familiar, but still just to recover. Uh, Markov process is a model of stochastic process, uh, which has some nice properties. Uh, for example, like future of the process doesn't depend on the past if we're given present. Uh, what it means is, is that if we have our state, current state S1, uh, it doesn't matter for us what was before this state. We just know that the probability to end up in a state S2 is fixed for us. Uh, so we can just not consider all previous uh, states of the system uh, if we know the current state. So the current state defines what, what is going to happen further. And this is called Markov property. And for discrete case, it is written on the bottom of the slide. So uh, X uh, sub N, uh, given all the previous axes uh, is equal to uh, x sub n given the just one previous state. So we, do we doesn't have to store the whole history, we're just interested in the state we are, we are at the moment uh, to find the next state or to estimate the probability to end up in the next state. So any questions so far? Is it clear? Are you familiar with Markov? process and Markov property. Okay, I will take it for yes, so you're familiar. And there is also notion of hidden Markov process. For example, we're interested in process uh, which is gray, which is hidden, some process, but we cannot measure or uh, observe this process directly. For example, in robotics, uh, X is our poses or pose plus orientation, uh, and but we cannot measure or observe pose directly. We cannot just take a ruler and measure where a robot is. Basically, we can, but this is not the case, right? Uh, but there is something else we can observe and which is related or produces our hidden state. Uh, so, if we're talking about localization, the whole localization problem uh, as a Markov process or Markov chain looks like this. So there is hidden process, which is a robot pose. We cannot measure it directly, but we have our control signals, which produce the pose, right? So the pose depends on the control signals we are giving the robot. Uh, so the arrow from control signals to poses means that uh, control signals produce pose basically. And given the pose, uh, we can have some particular measurement Z. Uh, so the pose at which the robot is produces a measurement because we measure something about environment like distance to walls, for example, or I don't know, height on above the floor. And this depends on the particular pose. That's why we are saying that uh, pose produces the measurement, but also measurement is produced by uh, environment itself, right? So distance to the walls depends on where these walls are. And this is uh, what maps ma map tells us. Uh, so this scheme uh, will be really useful for us further during the lecture. So try to understand it. So we have some hidden process, um, which we cannot measure or observe. And we have different things, for example, measurements, uh, control signals, which we know and we can observe. And we are trying to estimate hidden, uh, hidden process or tell something about hidden process, just given the processes we can observe. So, and here we come to probabilistic form of localization uh, problem. So here uh, on this slide, we had the simple localization problem, given that, find that, but actually the 
modern robotics operate with uh, probabilities. And we discussed it shortly in the last lecture, and we will discuss it in the next lecture more. Uh, but here, what's important for us is that we are actually not estimating in real systems. We are not estimating the single answer, like we are at this point of space or another point of space. We actually estimate probability density functions. So given map, all measurement vectors uh, and control signals, so commands we are giving the robot, we are trying to estimate the whole probability density function. Uh, so probabilities of different poses in space. Uh, and then to find the single pose, because it, at the end of the day, we have to, to answer directly where we are, to control or to plan some path of the robot. We just can find arg maximum of this probability density function, and arg maximum will give us the, our current pose, the most probable current pose. So is it clear, maybe, any questions? So once again, in modern robotics, we operate with probabilities, uh, and we are not estimating a single pose, we are estimating the whole probability density function. Uh, to use it differently, but also to find argmax and answer directly where we are. And here is a probability, probabilistic form of localization problem formulated by Sebastian Trun, uh, like a father of probabilistic robotics. On Piazza, you have a book from Sebastian Trun and his colleagues, which is called, called Probabilistic Robotics. Uh, I really suggest you to read it after the classes, and in the end of the, each lecture, I will tell you particular chapters you can read to find more on the topic covered in the lecture. So localization problem can be formulated as follows, given the vector of all successive sensor measurements, z from zero to t, or from one to t, and control signals from the first moment of time to current moment of time, it is needed uh, to recover a posterior probability density function of robot pose xt, uh, at any given moment of time t. So at any given moment of time, we want to answer the question where we are. So next thing we will need in this lecture is a Bison rule. Uh, I also hope you are familiar, but we will just shortly uh, remember what it is. So Bison or bias theorem uh, is something written on the slide and uh, it allows us to calculate posterior probability. So how probable that our hypothesis A is true given the evidence B. So given the B, how probable A is. Uh, and we can estimate it using this formula. Uh, and in numerator, we have uh, likelihood. So vice versa, how probable B given A. Uh, then probability of A itself, it is our prior probability. Uh, and then uh, in the denominator, we have marginal probability. So probability of B, which doesn't depend on A. So this is a simple equation, which is used a lot in different uh, like areas of science and robotics is not an exception. Uh, we will use it a lot. Uh, okay, so there is also law of total probability. I also hope you, you know it and remember. So probability of B, is the sum of probabilities uh, of B given different uh, outcomes of A. So different, uh, different hypothesis, hypothesis B depends on, uh, multiplied by probabilities of A sub I themselves. So basically we are trying to sum up all, all probabilities of B uh, depending on all probabilities of A. Um, we will also use it further. And to remember even better bias rule, bias theorem, we will have an example. Uh, imagine three shooters, uh, which are called to firing line, firing line and fire each fires, uh, I mean, one of three are called and fires two shots. The probability of hitting the target for first is 0 0.3, for second 0 0.5, and for third shooter is 0 0.8. Uh, and we know the outcome of the experiment. We know the target is not hit. So we have to find the probability that the shots were fired by the first shooter, which has uh, uh, probability 0 0.3 to uh, hit the target. 
we will have uh, such notions a1 a2 a3 for uh, probabilities of all three different shooters called to firing line uh, and we know that the probability uh, is equal to one third for each so they're equally probable to be called to firing line all three shooters and then using bias rule uh, we can estimate uh, b which is uh, event observed uh, shots fired and target was not hit for each of the shooter uh, and for that uh, we just take the probabilities of, of uh, target being hit, this ones, uh, one minus minus probability, uh, and we, we take it twice because we know that each that the shooter uh, took two shots. Uh, so those are probabilities uh, for target to not being uh, hit by for each shooter. And then using bison rule, which we saw here, uh, we can estimate uh, the probability for first shooter, and that was questioned. So, how probable uh, the shots were fired by the first shooter, and we, we get our answer. So, I have uh, I hope this small example just reminds you how to use Bison rule. So, in the numerator, we have the probability of uh, the first shooter uh, multiplied by the probability of the shooter to be uh, called on their own doesn't depending on the event observed so doesn't depending on was the target hit or not the probability for the first shooter or for any shooter in our question is equal one third and that's something that allows us to calculate the probability of the first shooter to be called and to fire these two shots and not hitting the target so having this formula in mind we now can uh, have some mathematical uh, equation which allow us uh, to solve localization problem. Uh, it can be a bit like scary at first, but we will uh, step by step discuss how how we can uh, come to Bison uh, localization problem. So let's take a look. This is our localization problem definition. So we want to estimate probability of uh, pose given the measurement and control signals, the whole vectors, right? So using bias rule, uh, we can come to this formula. So basically what we get here, we take Z, the last one, the last measurement, uh, and uh, write down the probability of Z given uh, X, uh, Z from one to T minus one, because Z at the moment of T is here. Uh, and we also have all control signals here. And here we have our initial uh, probability of x, but now we don't have z here, z at the moment of t. And this is what Bison rule gives us. And here is a normalization factor nu, uh, which is basically uh, this denominator, uh, just written in the form of uh, normalization, because it actually it doesn't depend for us uh, what is there, um, because it's just a normalization factor for us. So from here to here we got using bison rule and again what we are trying to do we're trying to somehow rewrite our problem so it's easier for us to solve because uh, there is no way to find this probability right away right we, we doesn't know how how to estimate probability of a pose given the measurement and control signals so it's it's not obvious that's why we're trying to do something with this equation just to to get some more uh, nicer form to solve. So after that, we can uh, use Markov property. Once again, Markov property tells us that given the state xt, we doesn't uh, depend on the previous states. So if we know the current pose of the robot, for example, uh, it doesn't matter for us uh, what the pre previous measurement or previous control signals were. We know that the next state depends only on the previous state. And that's something we use here. So uh, this first term here depends on the previous measurements and control signals. And first of all, we can reduce these previous measurements because uh, we know that the current uh, measurement, again, it's written here, current measurement Z, ZT depends only on the current pose. So ZT doesn't depend on anything and you can trace it with arrows. So arrow 
to ZT is only from map, obviously, because measurement depends on the map. Uh, and measurement on, also depends on the current robot state. So that's why we're, uh, we're crossing out these previous measurements. And also we know that measurements are, do not depend on control signals di directly. So control signals uh, produce the pose, but then the measurement depends only on current pose. Uh, so that's how we get from here to this simplest term much simpler term. Um, and then we use the law of total probability for this second big term. For the law. Then again, we use Markov property to simplify the first term because we know that current position, current pose depends only on the previous pose and current control signal. You can see it here again, that uh, this pose depends on previous pose and current control signal. Um, and doesn't depend on measurements, obviously. So we cross out measurements and uh, get simpler form here. Uh, and then again, using Markov property, uh, we can tell that uh, like estimated, uh, estimating X at time T minus one, we do not need uh, like control signal from the future, right? We are trying uh, to estimate X in a previous moment of time. And here we have control signal kind of from the future so we do not need it and we are, again can take only vector of control signals from one to t minus one and um, once again using uh, like simplification we come to the final formula what we can notice here that this term uh, t, uh, where we have x at time t minus one z from one to t minus one and control signals u from one to t minus one this is exactly what we started from this uh, but from the, for the previous uh, moment of time. So here we have t's and here we have t minus ones. And this means that this is a recursive formula, recursive equation. And here we call the whole thing belief, belief for x, x t. And then we can call this thing belief for x, x t minus one. And this is the far, final equation. So from, from here, just for, for, um, from probability, we came to some recursive form uh, which recursively will allow us to estimate something we will see what like, further along and this actually called recursive bias and pose estimation or just recursive bias and estimation so to estimate a probability of pose given the map measurement vector measurements vector and control signals vector we can use such framework uh, which is called recursive bias on estimation. Here, C is normalization coefficient. Uh, here we had nu, this, it is the same. Uh, I'm sorry for different notations in different slides. So here we had this nu. On the next slide, it is C. It's just a normalization coefficient. And then we have some probabilities. We will discuss what these probabilities mean. So here, uh, the first thing, let's take a look. Uh, we have here probability of a measurement given pose and a map. And this is something called observation or measurement model in robotics. So basically this uh, give us uh, the way to estimate the probability of measurement given robot pose. So for example, imagine you have uh, your sensor measurement distance to the wall. So we have a robot in front of the wall and we measure distance to this wall. Uh, so this thing is, uh, gives us the probability to measure some distance uh, having the fixed pose of the robot. For, for instance, imagine we are one meter away from the wall and we take a measurement and we know that our measurements are not precise. This is the thing why we have probabilities all over here. So this law or model, observation model, will tell us how probable that we will measure one meter, 0 0.5 meters or different different values. For example, if you have quite precise sensor, it is not probable that uh, having a wall one meter away, we will measure some 20 meters, right? Because we have a precise, uh, precise sensor, but still it is probable that we will have some deviation from one meter. And this is basically, this term describes the probabilistic error or measurement model of our sensor. Uh, so may, maybe any questions so far?
So this thing actually you don't have to memorize, but it would be nice for you to understand what, what we uh, made here. And if it was not clear, you can ask questions like right away or after lecture. What you have to remember is this thing. This is like framework which will allow us to estimate robot pose having all these uh, models, probabilistic models. And actually, like a lot of modern robotics like research is dedicated to defining this model because it's not a simple. Uh, but for now, I want you to understand a simple concept like observation model just uh, gives us the probabilities uh, of a measurement given the pose and amount. Also, there is this red thing which is called motion model. Uh, this is also quite simple. Given our uh, previous pose and control signal, we want to estimate uh, the current pose. So imagine we have a robot and we ask the robot to move uh, one, meters, one meter front, right? Uh, so the control signal would be move one meter front. Uh, and the previous pose, let's take it for zero. And how probable that commanding robot to move one meter front, we will end up in some particular pose. For example, we will end up in 10 meters. Uh, it's almost improbable, right? If we have really, really bad motors, it, is, it, is, it can be the case. But usually we still have somehow precise motors. So we most probably will end up in one meter from zero point but still there can be deviation, like uh, some motors will, can, some wheels can slip, uh, the surface can be uneven, so that's why we have this probability here. Not always commanding a particular value, uh, we will get the same result. Sometimes we'll have like, we will move uh, 0.99 meters front, right, or something like this. And we want to estimate it, like we want to uh, have a model describing how precise our motors are and things like that. So this is called motion model. This is also probabilistic model describing uh, where we are given our previous pose and control uh, command. And we have this recursive term. So it's the same, but for a uh, previous moment of time. So basically how we use this equation or this Bison uh, framework uh, is the following. We have a prediction step. So given the previous state of the system, Imagine we already estimated the probability for all axes uh, in previous moment of time. We first make a prediction. So based on the uh, motion model uh, and knowing the control signal for current moment of time, we just predict where we will end up, right? So this, this term is prediction. Given the previous state of the system and current control signal, we are predicting uh, what probabilities of different poses are. And then we have a correction step. Basically, uh, we get some new information with our measurements, right? So we measure something about the world and we correct our prediction by multiplying here, basically. Uh, so is it clear? Maybe some questions. Okay, uh, so once again, this is just an equation which gives us the way to estimate the uh, probability density function of x uh, recursively uh, having the previous state of the system and we make it uh, in two steps we first predict with our motion model and then we correct with our measurement model so on this step we do not use any measurements we just know that we commanded robot to move somewhere uh, and make a prediction did it move really to this point or some other point, uh, given the motion model which describes how precise our motors are, how good uh, environment is, uh, are there any external factors which uh, influence our motion and so on. And then we correct it using our observation model and basically it means that we are trying to compare what we uh, expected to see because we have a map, right? And uh, moving to somewhere, we know our expectation. We know that we, if we move to the to this room, there will be four walls and one door or something like that. Uh, and when we measure, we get some information on the environment. And we, we are trying just to compare our expectation and what we really measured to tell how probable that we are at the post we were thinking we are. 
So this is how it works. But this is just framework. You cannot just uh, plug numbers into this formula and give and get some answer because there are some uh, these probabilities which uh, have to be uh, like mathematically explained somehow, right? So uh, behind these probabilities, uh, these models uh, should be particular equations which tell us which number to plug where to get some numerical result, right? Or some distribution in our case. Um, so that's why recursive bias and estimation is just a framework. There are many particular algorithms realizing this framework. Um, you can see different ones, Kalman filter, information filter, histogram, particle, there are many, many more. Uh, and why there are so many? Because they uh, make different assumptions on these models, basically, uh, to simplify things. Uh, and the, there can be linear and nonlinear motion and observation models. We will see why it is important. Uh, there can be algorithms which work with only with normal or arbitrary error distributions. For example, this motion mo model can be normal or Gaussian, right? So we can say that there is Gaussian probability that we move to the particular point if we command the robot to, uh, to move there. Uh, or there can be some more complex uh, probability law which tells us uh, how a robot moves. Also, they can be parametric and non-parametric and again, many more uh, like decision to make. And that's why there are so many algorithms which are used uh, to solve this problem, to realize this bias and estimation framework. Uh, in this lectures, we will talk on two, Kalman filter. Uh, this is one of the most popular in the world. It is used not only for robotics, uh, it is used in many, many fields to estimate some process given like motion or uh, process model and some observation model. And also particle filter, it is also used in different problems, but we will see how it is applied in robotics. And again, if so far it looks complex, uh, I, I warned you last time this, that this lecture is probably the most complex in the whole course, the most mathematical one. Uh, but still, if you have questions, just don't hesitate to ask right away, like text me in Telegram or ask questions in Piazza. I will try to explain you one again, once again, if it's not clear. So, we will start with a Kalman filter. So, Kalman filter is algorithm which allows us to estimate state of some linear system. By this state, we can mean any, anything, like any state in robotics. We mostly use it for localization. So by state, we mean the robot pose and orientation. But I want you to understand that the same framework, the same algorithm can be used for different problems where you have some hidden uh, state of the system and you have some observations and you want to, uh, to know the hidden state, to estimate the hidden state. Uh, so the good thing about Kalman filter uh, is that it is optimal. So it gives us the, uh, it guarantees us the best uh, estimation we can get uh, if we satisfy two uh, prerequisites or two properties. First of all, Kalman filter works good only for linear motion and observation models. And by linear, we, we mean that like in these models, uh, there shouldn't be like some, I don't know, trigonometrical terms or like, uh, square roots or anything. So the system have to be linear and next slide will uh, explain you more what linearity is. And also uh, there is another uh, property we have to satisfy or our problem have to satisfy is that uh, we, we will have normally distributed motion and measurement errors. So once again, what, what is normally distributed like motion error? Uh, if you tell our robot to move one meter, uh, normally distributed motion error model uh, tells us that there is a Gaussian probability that we will end up with, with a mean in one meter. So with a mean in the uh, like place we commanded robot to move. And then it is Gaussian uh, like that robot will move to some other place. Uh, and it's the same for measurement error. If we measure like the distance to the wall, 
uh, there is a Gaussian probability that we will get the correct answer. So mean of the probability will be equal to real uh, distance to the wall. And then there will be descending probabilities that we will measure like more or less uh, distance. I hope it is clear. So if you satisfy these two properties or our problem actually, or our, our system satisfies these two pro properties, then Kalman filter is an optimal cho choice. And a bit more on linearity. So system is called linear if uh, like as a, a rule of thumb, you can use this. Uh, if the response of the system to the sum of input signals is equal to the sum of responses to each signal. Uh, for example, uh, if we have a robot and we ask it to move uh, like one meter, it is the same if we ask the robot to move 10 times to 10 centimeters. Uh, so that means that the response of the system to the sum of input signals is equal to the sum of responses to each signal. But also there are many, many properties linear system has to satisfy, homogeneity, additivity, time invariance, and many more. You can read it like after the lecture, but as a rule of thumb again, you can use this one. Uh, if you have the system like this and, and normally distributed motion and measurement errors, then you apply Kalman filter. And we will uh, try to, to explain Kalman filter mm, on the example of such system. Imagine we have a car which has a speed or velocity, speed actually in our case, and the travel distance. So we just want to work with a simple system 1D car which is moving just straight uh, or backward. Uh, we have a coordinate uh, of the car and velocity and this is our system. So we are trying to estimate the state of the system, both speed and coordinate. Uh, so at any given moment of time, our knowledge of the current system state is described by two elements. First one is the mean or like, like particular answer uh, of the system state. As we said, P is a coordinate, V is a speed. So we know where car is and we know the velocity of the car. Uh, and also we have a covariance matrix uh, which, is, which describes how sure we are on these numbers. So on the diagonal there are um, variances of both, uh, uh, of both uh, values and on the uh, like second diagonal there are uh, covariances. So there are these nice pictures which describe the system. So we have two coordinates, velocity and position. Uh, some particular point on this chart, on this plot, gives us the system state, right? So combination of P and V. Uh, and this white um, denotes the probability. So it denotes basically the covariance because we never sure at 100% where we are. We always have a probability. We always have uh, like the most probable answer as P and V, but actually we have a probability. And what the covariance matrix gives us is that these two variables can, can be uh, dependent, right? So given the speed, uh, we know something on our position, right? If we have higher speed, it is most probable that we have uh, like, that we moved further away. And that's why the covariance matrix uh, gives us some more information than just relation uh, between P and V. For example, on the bottom example, uh, you, we can see that probability density function uh, has some particular angle, which tells us that the higher velocity is, that the most more probable that we traveled further in the space. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, and the probabilities or like variances actually of, of P and V are uh, drawn on this chart so like we have these variances on the diagonal of covariance matrix uh, just to if you have bigger variance we less we are less sure where we are and what speed we have right and we have if we have uh, less variance we know precisely where we are more precise not precisely because there is always uncertainty so is it clear so far that we have a system with velocity and position uh, we describe our system with two things. First of all, like particular values, P and V, uh, which are actually mean values. So if you have probability density function, we just estimate mean values and, and use them as an answer. And also we have a covariance which, which describes our uncertainty. 
So at the moment, are there any questions? Okay. So let's move further. So as we said, in the Bayesian uh, recursive uh, Bayesian estimation, first step is a prediction. Prediction, and you will see this step in all algorithms we will discuss in, in two in common filter and particle filter. They both have two steps: prediction and correction. And first one, prediction, which is used, which uses only motion model. So here it is. Uh, given our uh, previous uh, position, we can estimate our new position uh, just by uh, summing up with delta t and the previous speed. Right. So this is simple formula. And just for here, we can uh, simplify things and say that our speed is not changing. This is a simplification, even though we know our speed is changing, we can use this simple model uh, and things still will uh, work out. Uh, but we could write down here some more complex uh, equation. It depends on your particular problem. Uh, of course, you always can use some simplification and Kalman filter still will work. So here we use it and we, we just say that we think that our speed is not changing. So this is our model, uh, motion model, right? And we can write it down in matrix form, uh, the same equations, but, but in matrix form. And here we meet our first matrix F, which is called uh, the process or system evolution matrix. This is like a standard term used when we talk on Kalman filter. Uh, we have a special matrix F, which depends on time, which is actually important. Uh, and this uh, matrix tells us how our system moves or evolves uh, because it's not always about motion, right? As we said, Kalman filter can be used for different problems. So this matrix tells us how system evolves from time uh, t minus one to time t. And about that, talking about our particular system, here it is. So we had previous state, which is blue, both in formulas and in chart. And we, from this system state, which was described by position and also covariance, uh, we move to some new state, which is magenta. Uh, and this matrix tells us how we move. So here we know that previous position uh, plus uh, delta t, uh, multiplied by our speed is gives us a new position and we say that our speed is constant is not changing and this is described by matrix f and we do this both for like uh, for these two terms for our estimation and this actually had here uh, you can see this uh, denotes estimated x and estimated uh, covariance matrix it is important to distinguish because then we will have X and the uh, covariance matrix sigma uh, without hat, and it is important to distinguish. So this hat tells us that it is something we estimated. estimated. Um, so, okay, and we do this both for P uh, and V for our answers and also for covariance. And just to remind you, if we are working with matrices and multiply our matrix sigma uh, with matrix A, uh, it is equal to uh, A from the left and A transposed to the right. Uh, so to multiply our covariance with a matrix, we just multiply it from two sides and from the right it is transposed. So this is how we estimate our X and our sigma. So the uh, system state and uh, covariance matrix of system state given the previous states. Okay, so, so far it is simple. We have some physical model which, which describes how our system evolves. We have our previous state and we can calculate our current state given those two things. Uh, so here on the slide you can see that F matrix relates our previous state and our current state. So uh, a bit more uh, like sophisticated here because we didn't use so far control signals, right? So this is just a speed, it is constant as we said, but there are also some control variables we can change. So for example, if we have our robot or our car here, 
by uh, speeding up or, or de decelerating, we can change the acceleration of the car, right? As a driver, we can press uh, the uh, acceleration uh, pedal or uh, like deceleration, braking pedal, right? And change uh, something about the state. So to this, uh, to this system we had, uh, with matrix F, we had to uh, add some control signals. In this uh, example, control signal uh, is acceleration. So we say that driver can control acceleration and the equation just uh, gets a bit more complicated, but still simple, right? You know all this equation from school. Uh, and again, this related to control signals variables, we put them in a special, a sp a special matrix, which is called B. And B is a matrix describing the change in control signals uh, in time moments uh, from T1, T minus one to T. So there's something which we not, do not control about our system and something we can control. And we just split into different matrices. Uh, it's also quite simple, I guess. Uh, and the last complication here is motion uncertainty. So as we said, our system uh, doesn't do exactly what we ask it to do. So if you have a car, imagine we have uh, like uh, wheels uh, and like for, for example, icy road. So if we command the car to accelerate or to move to some uh, place, uh, we are not always getting what we want it to because there are external factors and also the motor or pedals on the car are not precise themselves. That's why there is always uncertainty. So we do not end up in particular place. We have some probabilities that we travel to some place. Uh, and it is express, expressed by covariance matrix Q, uh, which describes the ran random nature of the system evolution. So all the external factors and internal factors uh, which make our uh, system not uh, predictable are just hidden in this matrix. And this is actually in the whole Kalman filter, it is the most complex part to determine this matrix because we have to consider all uh, factors which uh, can like spoil the result of the system evolution and we put them in this matrix. So this is, yes, this is it for the first step. So basically so far we described describe the prediction step given the blue, given the previous system state and having the model of our process, which we can uh, describe beforehand and some control signals, which we know because we are controlling the robot to do something basically. Even if, if it is autonomous, we know that robot decided to do something. Uh, so we know always these control signals and having these noises, we, we kind of estimate beforehand, uh, we can, tell something about the current state of the system using these equations. And also on the slide, we, we see that the system evolves for, from blue to magenta, and there is some additional uncertainty added up to uh, covariance. So that's why you can see that our uncertainty getting bigger, right? So because we don't have any new information coming to the system, basically we knew that we are somewhere, even maybe even quite precisely, and moving to some other place, we kind of lose information because we know that our motors are not precise. We know that environment is complex and not perfect. And moving to somewhere and trying to predict where we are, we have less information that we had. Even if we were certain where we are and move to somewhere, we kind of lo lost some information. Uh, so I hope it is clear so far. If not, let's get some questions. Okay, if there are no questions, we will move further. So we finished our first step, our prediction step, and then we are coming to correction step. And once again, let's return to the slide. What correction is? Uh, so, so far we didn't use any external information, any measurement information but now it is time to use something. Our robot always has some sensors, right? Which we can use to estimate uh, different uh, things, but here we use it to estimate our pose. Um, so having a measurement and knowing the process of measurement, the 
observation or measurement model, so how precise basically our sensors are, we can compare what we were expected to measure and what we measured in reality. And by comparison, we can tell something of where we are. Let's see how it works in our case. So first we make, um, we estimate what we are expected to measure. So for example, uh, we have, uh, we know that we can measure, for example, both position and velocity somehow, right? We have like encoders as we discussed in our last lecture or some other type of sensor which, which can tell us something on where we are. First, we predict the um, measurement. So because here we estimated uh, our pose and velocity, we can predict what our sensors would tell us uh, given the predicted pose and velocity. Or for example, uh, with the walls, right? If we moved somewhere, we, we estimated our new position and we can tell that our position is one meter close to the wall and we expect our measurement sensor to tell us one meter because we know uh, that we predicted that we are one meter away from, from the wall. And this is expected measurement. And we uh, computed with the matrix H, uh, which is the matrix describing the measurement model, how to get a measurement Z from a state X. For example, uh, they're not always uh, directly related. For example, we, our system, we, we are estimating position and velocity, but we have a, I don't know, temperature sensor, right? And the matrix, H gives us the way to relate temperature and position. This is again the matrix we defined beforehand because we know the robot we are designing. And we know that uh, like given the pose using some equation, some uh, like matrix H, uh, we can uh, estimate the temperature and vice versa. This is just artificial example, but for you to understand that these things are not always directly related. And matrix H tells us how to relate measurements uh, given the state, how to find measurement or estimate expected measurement given the state X. So, and then we have really measured things. Here we have expectation, what we expected to measure because we have a prediction. Uh, and here we have really measured things. And again, every measurement is not just a number, like distance to the wall, but number and uh, covariance, because we know that sensors are not precise. And we and if we buy a sensor, there is always a data sheet which tells us uh, the precision of the sensor and we can uh, construct a covariance, build a covariance matrix based on this information on our sensor, how precise it is. And those we get, those distributions we get, expected distribution and measured distribution, they're somehow plotted on the one uh, like space. And we see that they're different. And what we want uh, to make is to extract some more information. So we have our prediction, we have real measurement, uh, and we can say how they're related and make some conclusion on uh, how we have to correct our prediction uh, so they look uh, similar. And this uh, like simple thing, if you have two normal distributions, and I have to remember you that in Kalman filter, we only work with no normally distributed uh, motion and measurement errors. So we say that all sensors have uh, normal distribution, uh, normally distributed error, and all our motors, all our motions have normally distributed errors. And that's why we, we can use this simple formula. So if we have two normal distributions with their parameters, how to uh, calculate or estimate the product of these two distributions. And here are formulas for mean and variance. Uh, just simple formulas, you don't have to remember them, but uh, they're quite simple and understandable. If you have two normal distribution, we can uh, estimate the resulting distribution. And the magic of Kalman filter is the following. If we have two normal distributions, uh, in, in our case, we have expected distribution and uh, measured distribution, the resulting distribution is more precise so it, it has more information than we had before. So basically we combine two uncertainties and we get something more certain. This is a kind of magic you have to understand here in Kalman filter. And once you understand it, the, the whole idea of the Kalman filter uh, 
is clear. So again, here, for example, we have these two distributions and the resulting distribution will be somewhere in the middle, right? Where these two distributions uh, are crossing. And this is a magic. We'll have some distribution, which is right here, uh, which is more precise that, than either of these two distributions we had before. And that's what Kalman filter uh, does. It has expected distribution, pre, uh, like measured distribution. It combi combines them and gives us more precise answer. Uh, this is in matrix form because Kalman filter is usually written in matrix form. It is the same as this, but just written in matrix form. And to simplify things, we, we have a K, K here, which is just uh, this formula of covariances of these two proce processes. Uh, and in Kalman, this K is called gain, Kalman gain. Um, and it will be just used in the formulas to simplify things. But you have to remember always that behind this K, there is just these two covariances. Uh, so K will change over time because covariances uh, change. So we estimate uh, things and estimate covariance on every step. So, and to estimate our mean and covariance, we will use these two simple formulas. Uh, so I will, I guess we will skip this slide and slides and just get to the final formulas. You can um, see them in more details after the lecture. This is just mathematical uh, like simplifications to get to these formulas. And this is the whole Kalman filter basically. And you will see the familiar uh, equations here. So the first step of the Kalman filter is prediction. Uh, we use F, which is evolution matrix, which is our motion uh, model basically and we use b which is the matrix telling us how our state changes depending on control signals and the same for covariance but for covariance we have this q which is at uncertainty additional uncertainty we inject into the system because we know the the space is not even the world is not perfect our like uh, motors are not perfect and so on so this is the first step, really simple. And this is the second step. So we estimate K, as I said, and then we estimate a uh, new state and new covariance given the real measurement Z and uh, measurement covariance here R. Uh, and H is our prediction. So basically here we're um, uh, finding the difference between real measurement and predicted measurement. Uh, and make some conclusion on our state space and the same for covariance. So I, I, for, for now, it is important for you just to understand the concept. And I think it's understandable with this picture. So having two uh, Gaussian processes, we estimate new process, which is in our estimation gets even more precise than uh, two estimations we had before. And the whole Kalman filter is written in five equations. Uh, and that's really good uh, thing for us because to program Kalman filter, we just have to write down five uh, matrix uh, formulas. And that's it, that the whole Kalman filter. And the most complex part here is not even to program it, uh, but to beforehand estimate different matrices to construct the measurement or to, I'm sorry, to construct a motion model of the system because it involves some physics, right? We have to know how physically our system ev uh, evolution um, proceeds uh, to construct this model. And also we have to estimate some uh, noises beforehand. So we have to sit and think how precise our motors, how uh, like even the floor is and put it into the matrix cool beforehand. And basically that's it. You will have your first homework on Kalman filter. Uh, it's going to be simple. Actually, the all equations are will be programmed and the, I want you to see how what we discussed here, how, how all these formulas are relate to what is programmed in your homework. And you will have only to fill out the matrices and then to run the things and see the result and to analyze the result, to analyze what predictions and corrections Kalman filter made. Uh, so I think I will distribute this first homework uh, like in a week. And as I said, it's gonna be simple. Everything will be programmed for you. You will just have to plug some numbers to matrices 
given the description of the system and to see how Kalman filter works. Okay, so moving further, uh, once again, this is a simple picture uh, about Kalman filter. So we have prediction from one uh, Gaussian process to another, then we have measurement and we have two Gaussians and multiplying them, we get something more precise than before. Uh, so what is the problem with Kalman filter? Uh, as we said, the system has to be linear, right? Uh, and we have to have linear motion model and observation model. But in real life, uh, there is not that many systems which are linear. For example, if we have our robot and we want to estimate just position in space, X and Y, the system can be linear. But as soon as we want to estimate angle, uh, it is not linear anymore because this uh, motion model, if we want to estimate orientation of the robot, it will involve some uh, trigonometrical functions, sine, sine cosine, and, and things like that. And as soon as we have that, the system uh, becomes non-linear. And this is a kind of problem because we still want to use Kalman filter because it is really simple, it has like five uh, equations we have to program to estimate everything. Uh, so we still want to use it, right? Uh, so we have to find nonlinearity somehow because we know that Kalman filter is an optimal choice for linear systems. Um, yeah, and it is written on the slide basically. So angle estimation or orientation estimation will lead to some trigonometric uh, functions in the system the output uh, of non-linear system is no, no longer a normal distribution. Yes, so the main tragedy for us is that putting into the linear system normal distribution, we will have something which is not normal or not Gaussian anymore as, a out, as an output. And this is a problem for us because Kalman filter have uh, Gaussian in, as an input and Gaussian as an output. And we cannot apply in Kalman filter anymore in this case. So there are many solutions and many modifications of basic Kalman filter to solve exactly this problem. Uh, so for example, we can have local linearization of models. So we can at particular point have a linearization. For example, with Taylor series, uh, we can linearize our equations at particular point and use it this uh, approximation. There is also popular sigma points approximation. Uh, it is called unsanded transform. We will talk like uh, what it is in a minute. Uh, so this is, these are two main uh, like modifications of Kalman filter to find, to fight uh, non-linearities. Let's talk about them a bit more. So, First one is a linearization at the point. So imagine we have a linear system, right? And we have a Gaussian as an input and Gaussian as an output because the system is linear, right? Uh, if you have a nonlinear system, for example, something like this, nonlinear function, right? Uh, plugging Gaussian as an input, we will have something really complex and weird as an output, which is not Gaussian anymore and most often cannot be even approximated by Gaussian because here we, we've got something multi-model model and something really complex. This is the problem we're trying to solve. So it can be solved. Uh, yeah, and these equations are not applicable anymore because this works when the system is linear and when it is non-linear, we just have some function J, which is complex, non-linear, uh, and for, uh, our covariance, we also have some. Uh, for our mean, expected mean, we also have some something uh, really unlinear, which we just write down as a function. Um, these two things are unlinear. I, I will remind you that H is our me measurement model. Uh, so how we relate measurement and current pose, and this F and B, uh, constructs our motion model. So how we relate previous pose, control signals, and current pose. So both these things become nonlinear, uh, and we have to do something about this. 
So what we can do uh, is to use extended Kalman filters. It is, you will often uh, meet this annotation, uh, extended Kalman filter or EKF. Uh, what we have, what we, we're performing here is line linearization with Taylor series. Basically, basically we know uh, with a Taylor uh, equation that we can approximate our nonlinear function with some raw, really long one. Uh, but here we use simplification and use just a couple of terms. Uh, and here are Jacobian matrices. So Jacobian matrices, this is a basically a gra gradient for uh, vector functions, right? So gradient or derivative for vector function. Uh, so here is an example. If you have a complex uh, function, uh, the Jacobi, matrix uh, at some particular point gives us the plane orientation of a plane normal to the vector function in the given point. So basically we have gradients or derivatives, partial derivatives uh, in all places in Jacobi matrix. And this is something we used for uh, Taylor series when we have a vector complex vector function. Uh, we will approximate our function in particular point with a plane normal to this point. Of course, this is simplification. And of course, this sometimes really uh, rough simplification, but still it works and allow us to use Kalman filter even when our system is nonlinear. But it is important to understand that in this case, Kalman filter is not optimal anymore. So there is no guarantee that we get an optimal solution, but we will get some solution. And practice shows that we will get really good solutions sometimes. So we still can use Kalman filter. It's just uh, not optimal anymore. And to use, this, uh, use it, we can use this simplification. We just linearize our complex vector function at that particular point. Uh, so, and it, it works only because Jacobian matrices or derivatives are linear functions. So from nonlinear function, we get the simplification uh, which uses derivatives which are linear and that's how we get the linear functions and we can apply Kalman filter but we, we of course we lose precision because we approximated something really complex uh, with a just plane uh, and of course this is simplification so here is an example if you have this complex blue function uh, at some particular point we can calculate uh, normal uh, to this point, uh, in case of 1D uh, function, this is just a line, right? In case of complex vector function, this is a plane or uh, even something more complex uh, if we are living not in 3D space or, uh, uh, but in space with some more uh, values. And so in complex vector function, which can have infinitely uh, many uh, vectors. So, in simple 1D case, we just have a normal and use this normal uh, to represent our system instead of real system representation, which is not linear. And then uh, having Gaussian process uh, as an input, we have a Gaussian as an output, which is red. And you can see that it somehow approximates a real output we would get. Uh, of course, this is a not perfect approximation, but still it is a, Gaussian as an output, which allow us to further use the Kalman filter. And that's how we fight this nonlinearity in this case. So there is another approach, which I like more, uh, which called unsended Kalman filter, this uh, modification to Kalman filter. It uses sigma point, uh, like sigma points to approximate the distribution. And we will not get into the mathematical details. We will just discuss the concept. Imagine we have a Gaussian distribution. So these circles uh, represent 2D Gaussian. Like, do they have a picture somewhere of 2D Gaussian? So something like this, just plotted uh, from top. So imagine we have this Gaussian distribution. It can be any complex distribution uh, in uh, infinitely uh, many spaces, but we just, as example, we use this. So what we do, if we take some points, not the whole distribution, but some particular points. Uh, they called sigma points, and there is a specific theory how to choose these points. For example, we obviously want to take mean of Gaussian distribution, right? Of mean 
uh, and some maybe points uh, like sigma away from mean to uh, every direction and many something more. So there is the whole theory how to choose the sigma points. We, we will not discuss it. Then we have our nonlinear system. And instead of uh, having the whole Gaussian as an input, uh, like here, like the whole Gaussian, every point, right? Uh, we, we will use just these sigma points, uh, run them through the system, and we'll have new set of points. And we can approximate these points again with Gaussian. And this is, again, this is a real simplification because we, we do not know the real distribution. We just know some samples from this distribution. So these points are basically samples from distribution which we use to run through our system uh, and get some answers. So we sample, we perform the calculations which our simple system represents and have a point as an input. And we do this for some number of points. And then these points, uh, output points, we just approximate them with Gaussian. Again, this is approximation. Uh, it not always works perfectly. We lose some precision. Kalman filter is not optim optimal anymore, but at least we can work with Gaussians and we hope that our approximation is somehow valid. So this is how uh, Kalm, unsended Kalman filter works. So the basic idea is the same, but we use these sigma points to, uh, to stay Gaussian, to stay normal. Okay, that's it on Kalman filter. And we have one more filter to, to discuss. It is much simpler uh, to understand, I guess. Uh, it is sometimes simpler to implement in real life, and you also have will have a homework on particle filter. Um, so you will compare Kalman and particle filter and see what, what is better for you, because some people prefer Kalman, some people prefer particle filter. They are really different, with different pros and cons. But at least to understand, I, I think particle filter is much simpler than Kalman filter with these complex equations. But Still, I hope you, you've got the simple idea behind Kalman filter with two Gaussian processes, but particle filter is even more simpler, even simpler. So particle filter is also called Monte Carlo localiza localization because we use Monte Carlo principle um, in this filter. Uh, and why it is sometimes better than Kalman filter? Because it works with any, even nonlinear motion and observation models. So for particle filter, it doesn't matter. You can have really complex motion models, any uh, really complex observation models. Uh, they can be even multi-model. So we, have, we can have measurement model like this. And to give you like concrete example, what it means, multi-model measurement model, uh, so imagine you have a model. Uh, okay, imagine the case we are in the room again, and we have a sensor which measures dis distance to the wall, right? And if we measure distance one meter to the wall, what tells us what it tells us about our position? Uh, given that there are four rooms, four walls, sorry, in the room. Uh, it, we can be in four different positions. So it is probable uh, that we are in four different positions. If we measured one meter to the wall, we can be on the like front wall one meter away. We can be on the right wall one meter away, on the left, on the wall behind, right? So these four uh, positions are equally probable. And this is multimodal distribution, right? This is not, there is no single position which more probable than others. There are four positions which are quite uh, like equally probable because we have really simple uh, sensor which measures only distance to some wall. We don't know to which one, for example, like just imagine. So we have four positions in space which are equally uh, probable. And this is multimodal distribution. We, we, we don't have a uh, mechanism to choose between them. And Kalman filter, filter cannot work with these things because it works with normal distributions which are unimodal. There is one uh, peak in this distribution which is the more probable one. Here things are getting more complex. Yeah, and also nice thing about Monte Carlo localization or particle filter is that it can solve global localization problem. We didn't discuss it yet. We, we only discussed what localization problem is. And global localization is a specific form of localization problem. Uh, it is a localization that when we doesn't know initial position. 
So we discussed that like we usually have initial estimate in Kalman filter. We had something which was called like previous system state, right? And we somehow know it. So sometimes we just switch on the robot and the robot doesn't know where it is in the world like at all. Uh, there are different like sensors which can tell us, for example, GPS uh, sensor or glo global navigation system can give us some uh, like at least approximation of our initial pose and then things are getting simpler. But there are sometimes cases when we no doesn't know, uh, we do not know where we are and Kalman filter works really bad uh, with such problem and particle filter can handle it. So there are many texts on the slide. I will try to explain you simpler uh, how particle filter works. And there is a simple pseudo scheme, pseudo algorithm of particle filter. But for now, at least for the moment, it's better to, to see uh, pictures how it works. So in particle filter, uh, we approximate our distribution by discrete points. So if in Kalman filter we had real like model of uh, Gaussian or normal process, so we had uh, like continuous uh, probability function. Here we just say that we will use discrete uh, samples, discrete hypothesis or particles uh, about robot pose to describe the probability. So just imagine, uh, instead of having Gaussian like uh, continuous Gaussian, we have several hypotheses which are called particles. So we say that we think robot is here with some probability, we, we think robot is here with some probability, and we can have like many particles like this, many hypotheses like this. Uh, each hypothesis is a robot position and orientation, uh, and each hypothesis has a weight, and this weight is uh, representing the probability of each particle. And we will uh, discuss in a moment how this weight is uh, calculated. So, so we have this hypothesis, discrete ones, and what we do, we propagate them in space using something familiar for you already, motion model. And this motion model here can be really complex, nonlinear, any motion model you could imagine, just uh, something which relates control signal uh, previous robot state uh, to the current robot state. And of course, because it's probabilistic and there are some noises involved and we construct the model in the way it is probabilistic, this hypothesis will move to a bit different directions, a bit different distances, uh, and that's okay. So we will have new distribution of particles in space, new distribution of hypothesis. Each hypothesis represents robot pose. And we, again, uh, become less certain on our space. If you remember in Kalman filter, the uh, covariance matrix uh, applied makes our uh, uncertainty bigger. Here it is the same. So because different particles will move slightly different distance because of the noises uh, in our measurement model and slightly turn to slightly different angles, we'll have new distribution with, which is wider and uh, less certain. Uh, on the next step, we will use correction. So we will use our measurements and using our measurement model, we will uh, estimate first how probable each particle is, each hypothesis is. So again, the simple idea, uh, expecting to measure one, uh, like a wall on one meter from us and having positions of each hypothesis, we can, uh, and the real measurement. So real measurement tells us something about the world. We have estimation which we should measure uh, given the particle pose. We compare these two things uh, and make a decision how probable particle is. For example, if we have a wall on one meter away according to particle pose, but our sensors, sensor tells us that wall is 10 meters away, this particle is not quite probable because uh, expected measurement and real measurement are not similar at all. So we estimate for each particle the probability. And then we have a step called resampling. This is just a probab probabilistic uh, step which discards particle which are less probable and uh, like uh, copies or multiplies or duplicates particle which are more probable. And because it is probabilistic, even particles with low probabilities are still have a chance to survive, but they have really small chance. 
So basically, we will discuss it in more details, um, like how this resampling works. But it's basically uh, like as in casino, where different sectors have different sizes. So depending on the particle weight, the sector size for this particle is bigger. And the more weight, the more probable the particle will survive and duplicate. So the number of particles stays constant uh, at each step. Uh, so we all we, we decide uh, on the beginning if we want to have 100 particles or 1000 particles and obviously more particles we have the more precise our estimation is but the more computationally complex the particle filter is because we have to perform a motion model and measurement model for each particle we want to compute like measurement and motion for each particle uh, more particles we have the more computational resources we need. So there is a trade-off between those two things. So still we're uh, telling here that there are some measurement models, some motion models. Uh, they're still for some still unclear for us uh, how we express them in particular equations. And we will discuss both motion models uh, and observation models in further lectures. You will see how to construct these models for different um, for different uh, sensors and different types of robots and to plug them in particle filter or in Kalman filter. For now, it's just important for you to understand the concept of Kalman filter and particle filter. Uh, but here we will uh, discuss resampling step. Again, this is a step when we discard some unprobable particles and duplicate some probable. Imagine each circle is a particle or hypothesis. Uh, so from step t to t plus one, some particles will be discarded, some particles will be duplicated, and so on. So basically, some particles die, some particles uh, make their clones, but the number of particles is always constant. So we, at each step, we have, in this case, five particles, but some of them just are replicated, uh, some of them are discarded. So, and again, uh, how resampling works and different resampling techniques. So imagine we have a circle and each uh, sector of a circle is uh, denotes particular particle and the more probable particle is, and probability is estimated with measurement model. So how well this particle fits to measurement. So the pr more probable particle is, the bigger is a uh, circle sector representing this particle. And basically we have a roulette, we have a random number uh, saying some direction. And if we uh, get some direction, we take this particle. So this is called multinomial uh, resampling. And this, this is the simplest one. It has some bad properties actually. That's why people came up with different resampling algorithms which are better. Um, so, but the simplest one, multinomial, so we just generate random uh, number from zero to 360 uh, degrees, right? And take the particle uh, which is uh, represented by the sector our uh, angle points to. And obviously particles represented by bigger sector have bigger chance to be selected in such scheme. But there are many, many more techniques, for example, systematic, uh, is a good one and actually at the moment it is most often used one so here we just uh, we, we, we just take uh, evenly distributed directions and take particles we point to so you can see that these arrows have uh, the same angle between them and you can see that it works good because this particle for example and this particle which have high probability they were chosen twice and meanwhile, particles with small probabilities were either not chosen at all or chosen just once. So this works and this is really simple and this algorithm has really nice properties which we are not uh, going to discuss in this course. But uh, for me at the moment is important so you understand resampling process. So given the particle probability, we have a chance to either select this particle multiple times or uh, to select to discard particles. And this is how particle filter works. So this is simple simulation of 2D robot. So robot is in blue. Uh, this um, blue lines denote the measurements. So this robot is equipped with, for example, LiDAR, which we discussed in 
previous lecture, uh, which measures distance to particular, in particular angles. So it measures distance to walls. Uh, it has a map and it compares, uh, for each particle, it compares real measurements the robot get with the uh, uh, measurements it would get if it will be in the pose of this particle, of this hypothesis. And you can see in the beginning that particles are evenly distributed in the whole map. And after some moment, there are uh, like really dense distribution. Uh, there is still an error, but all particles are really close to each other because particles which are unprobable, like kind of died, and particles which were probable are copied. And, but still, in the first moment of time, you can see that there are several um, uh, several hypotheses, basically se several hypothesis clusters. And this is good about particle filter because, as we said, it is multi-modal, multi so we can track several different hypotheses uh, because rooms in this case are look familiar, uh, look similar. And at the first point of time, robot is not sure either it is in this room or in this room because walls are quite similar. But as it moves through the space, it becomes more and more uh, certain about the, its position. And hypothesis, which has uh, less weight because the new measurements are not uh, like uh, not satisfying these particles, this hypothesis, uh, this hypothesis are, are dying. There, there is another example. So again, we start with a uh, evenly distributed hypothesis because at the first moment of time, as we said, in, in case of global localization, we doesn't know anything. So we just evenly distribute particles all over the map. Uh, sometimes we know something and we can use it, but here we didn't. And you can see that there are two major hypothesis clusters still. So robot in this room and this hypothesis are dying because this room looks quite different from this one. And we get measurements which tell us that these particles in this room are more probable than those which were in this room. And with time, with the collected measurement, we become more and more short on where we are. Where we, are. we see that there are many probable hypothesis clusters. And as we are moving through the space, some of them become less probable. And that's why uh, during the resampling process, these particles are discarded and more probable particles which are here are copied or duplicated and with the moment uh, goes we will become more and more sure so we discussed two algorithms Kalman filter and particle filter and there is always a question when we design our robot there is always question on which one to choose and there are some nice things about both for example particle filter can work with arbitrary multimodal uh, distribution while uh, Kalman works only with Gaussian uni unimodal. But solution of Kalman filter is optimal, but uh, only for linear systems. Uh, then particle filter is simple to implement. It actually depends. Some people say that Kalman filter is much simpler to implement because as we saw, there are just five equations. But the complex thing about Kalman filter is that uh, we have to derive physical model. As you remember, we had our physical mo model related, uh, relating position to uh, velocity. If we have more complex system, we have more equations. And sometimes there is like 20 equations de describing our system and things become complicated. In case of particle filter, usually it is much simpler. Uh, we will see in the next lectures how simple it is. But now, for now, take for granted that it's usually much simpler. Also, particle filter is robust, uh, much more robust than Kalman filter because as we saw, it can track many positions. So even if we get lost sometimes, we can restart, uh, just distribute our hypothesis all over the map and still recover our, our pose. This is not the case for Kalman filter. If it gets lost, uh, there are really small chance that it will find itself again. So there is moderate robustness. Also, particle filter can solve global localization, as we said, and computational speed is uh, for common filter because it is really fast. We just perform matrix uh, calculations. It is really, really fast. Uh, in, com in particle filter, we have to choose between the hypothesis number, which is uh, like precision. More hypothesis we have, more precise the estimation is. Uh, and uh, computational resources. So there is always trade-off, but like uh, as a general rule, Kalman filter 
is much more computationally efficient. And we have, we, if we tell, uh, if we consider extension to Kalman filter, for example, extended Kalman filter or unsanded Kalman filter, it fixes this first uh, thing. So it can work now with arbitrary, uh, still unimodal distribution, so kind of solves the problem, but you can see that solution, which was optimal, is not op optimal anymore. It becomes approximate. So uh, both algorithms are good. Both are really used in real systems, and there are many, many real robots using both of these approaches. Apart from that, there are many more algorithms. These two are most famous and most popular ones, but there are still even more. And actually, like in modern robotics, uh, you can see the trend, starting trend, like last two years, top conferences, you can see many works dedicated to not using both of these approaches, but using optimization. So just discuss localization problem as an optimization problem. So you don't need any physical models. You just have measurements of different sensors and you can minimize the, the uh, difference between them. So you try to find optimal solution when error of which sensor will be minimal. And you say that this is your estimation, this is your current cost. So there are also optimization uh, algorithms, but still usually when we, when we talk about localization, we are talking about these two algorithms. So that's it for this lecture. I really recommend you to uh, read this first link, how a common filter works in pictures. This is where I took pictures, this nice black pictures from. And this is, at least for me, this is the most uh, like uh, simple, the simplest and the, uh, the, the well, I would say this is the best description uh, of Kalman filter I could find. So really a good one. Uh, I really recommend you to, to read it. It is simple and really, really good and makes you the feeling uh, how Kalman filter works. Also, there is this famous book by, by Sebastian Trun at his colleagues, which is the father of probabilistic robotics. Uh, you have it in Piazza. Uh, and I would recommend you to read first uh, like four chapters and then chapter seven and chapter eight. And also there is a Kirill Stachny's course uh, on YouTube. Uh, it is on SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping algorithms, which we are not discussing in this course. But first lectures are actually from about particle filter, Kalman filter. So this is really good. And Kirill is uh, one of the best roboticists so far, like uh, uh, at the moment, uh, like all over the world. So I really recommend his course for you if it's something unclear from this lecture. And also you, will, you can always ask questions in Telegram and Piazza, reach me uh, somehow in, through email and ask what, what becomes unclear or what stays unclear uh, after this lecture. And as I said, you will have two homeworks, one on Kalman filter, one on particle filter. They're quite simple. There is code written for you. You will have just a, to either realize some additional functions or fill out uh, matrices. Uh, so these homeworks, I hope, will allow you to understand in more details what we discussed here and to relate like mathematical formulas to programming, which is always good and always allowed to understand better how things work. So that's it from me for today. Are there any questions?